Good morning. Today we talk about input and output concepts, and then we'll get down to the, to the real detail, away from the concepts and into the nitty gritty on Tuesday. Early in the course, we saw the input process output um, abstraction for computing, a model of computing, where an input is transformed by whatever the process of the computer is to produce an output. And we had storage there. If you look, storage is really a combination of input and output. But it's a little bit, we treat it a little bit differently and think about it a little bit differently because it's, it, it really it's fundamentally different even though it is a combination of input and output. The, the input and output devices are sometimes called peripheral devices. The periphery of something is that stuff that's around the edges. So the periphery of this campus has the McDonald's and El Ranchero and some apartments and things like that. Um, the edge area of the computer then are the so-called peripheral devices. We have some problems and, and some things to think about and worry about. Um, one of them is that several devices can perform I.O. simultaneously. We don't have just one at a time. We can get unexpected input, that is, asynchronous input. So I'm sitting here with this clicker in my hand, and it uh, simulates the page down key to change slides, but the operating system and PowerPoint don't have a clue when I'm next going to click the clicker, right? The timing is unexpected. Um, there are different input and output formats. The, the slide only says input, but we can have different output formats as well. Every device provides status information. At the minimum, I have data ready for you or I don't have data ready for you. Um, the actual input and output is almost always performed by the operating system. And we'll talk about why a little bit later this morning. Um, that is, application programmers, although they have input and output instructions, those input and output instructions are actually operating system calls. So there are two ways of designing computer architecture to do input and output. One of them is memory mapped I.O. And in memory mapped I.O., a small number of locations in memory would be reserved for input and output. And so I don't need any special I.O. instructions. And that is an advantage when designing a computer. There's some disadvantages too. If I write to one of these special memory locations, it's going to send data to an I.O. device. So the, the same mechanism I would use to store data in memory can also send data to an input or output device, actually an output device in that case. Reading from memory gets data from an input device. So that's kind of Kind of simple and elegant, although it has some problems, one of which is that not all of the memory address space is available for real, for actual memory. We also have to reserve memory locations for status information and command information. The other choice is port mapped I.O. And modern computers are likely to do things this way. They're likely to have a separate address space for the I.O. devices and separate input and output instructions. So instead of just using the um, read from memory and store to memory instructions, we have separate instructions for input and output. And the tiny binary computer works that way. Um, operation code 9 is used for both input and output. That means I can use the full memory address space for real memory. I don't have to worry about accidentally activating an I.O. device by writing to memory where I think I'm storing data. But I have to have separate input and output instructions. So the design of the computer system is perhaps more complicated, but 
I get that full memory address space. It used to be, and I don't think there are any modern designs that do this, it used to be that some computer designs did it both ways. The, the graphic device, the display device, would be memory mapped so that you could write to it quickly. And everything else would be port mapped. That is unusual now. You're going to see in a little bit this morning that we use PCI Express to connect the graphic device to the CPU. And PCI Express is plenty fast enough to drive a fast display device. Two different basic kinds of devices, block devices and character devices. Disks and tape transfer data in blocks. I cannot read one byte of data from a disk. I might read a whole block and use only one byte but I can't read just one byte. Similarly, I can't write just one byte to a disk. Disk blocks tend to be of fixed size, and the modern disks tend to have 4,096 byte blocks. Not, it's not necessary that you remember that. Older disks used to have 512 byte blocks because we had smaller memories some years ago. Tape can have blocks of variable size. I've already said that only entire blocks can get read or written. I might use only a byte or two out of that block, but I gotta read the whole block. If I update one byte, I've gotta write back the whole block. Other devices like keyboards and mice are character devices, one character at a time, instead of 512 or 4096 bytes at a time. The I.O. control module, and this is a very high level, very abstract diagram. The I.O. control module sits between the CPU and the I.O. devices and might also have a connection to memory. We're going to see a more detailed diagram a little bit later this morning. But the key here is that the CPU talks to some hardware that talks to the I.O. device rather than talking directly to each I.O. device. The I.O. control module provides registers, um, may be able to do direct memory transfers, physically controls the device. So things like printers, we might have a command to eject a page when we're finished printing that page, and the I.O. control module does that physical control. Could notify the CPU of, of the device status using an interrupt. We'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later as well. The I.O. control module can recognize messages, and by messages I mean status signals, messages from the devices, and it can accept commands from the CPU. So it's, it is the interpreter between the I.O. device and the CPU. It can also provide storage, a buffer where data from memory can be held until it's transferred to the I.O. device. And it works in the other direction, copy data from its buffer to either the I.O. device or from the CPU to the buffer. Different kinds of formats for I.O. devices. We talked about parallel and serial interfaces, and we can have both kinds. Um, buffering of data. Buffering means storing data in a temporary location until it can be put wherever it's going to go. Um, and in fact, uh, I don't know whether any of you remember early streaming audio. Sometimes you would get a pause with the message buffering while we're catching up with the stream, right? This is exactly the same thing. Um, the, the player device holds enough data to be able to play continuously until you drive under that bridge on I-85 and you're not talking to the satellite anymore, and then there's a lot of silence and then some buffering. So that is that is the meaning of buffering. Data can come in bursts as a continuous stream or as a block. Um, and I pushed the wrong mash button. Um, there are different control requirements. So I can backspace a tape drive. 
you try to backspace a printer, you're probably going to jam the paper, okay? Um, physical disks, magnetic disks, have control requirements for moving the disk heads. There are some speed considerations. The CPU operates much faster than even the fastest I.O. devices. We're going to find out a little bit later that the difference is about 10 to the 6th, about a million times faster. So it's, it's a really big difference. Um, when we talk about CPU speeds, we're talking about nanoseconds. Remember, now a nanosecond is about this long. Um, when we talk about I.O. devices, we're talking about milliseconds. And that is a difference of 10 to the 6th, or about a million times. Now, is a, a given disk exactly a million times faster than a given CPU? No. But that's a pretty good guess about the difference. Different kinds of devices operate at different speeds. Um, a magnetic device, a magnetic disk device is slower than a, um, an electronic disk, a solid state disk. Some devices produce bursts of data. A network device can produce a, a block of data and then sit there quietly for a while. Um, I've already said that for disks and tapes, we transfer data in blocks. So, there are three approaches to I.O. transfers. One of them, and this is almost never used, programmed I.O. is controlled by the CPU. And there's more detail coming up. Um, Interrupt-driven I.O. is quite frequently used. And direct memory access, or DMA I.O., is almost always used for things like disks and tapes that, that transfer data in blocks. Programmed I.O., which might, it might be used to start an I.O. operation, but it's almost never used throughout the I.O. operation. There are I.O. data and address registers in the CPU, just like we have memory and data and address registers. Okay? And we transfer, when we do I.O. with programmed I.O., one word or one byte at a time. There is address information for each I.O. device, so we have a, an I.O. address register to receive that information. It takes a full fetch decode execute cycle to start an I.O. operation. And then we do this thing that is called busy waiting. So who has gone on an automobile trip with a two-year-old? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? How many times did you hear, are we there yet? How many times are there? A whole lot. Okay, this is the same thing. Busy waiting, the CPU continually checks. Is it done yet? And while it is doing that, it can't do anything else. Okay? Now, we can use programmed I.O. with busy waiting to talk to I.O. controllers because the I.O. controller is going to answer, yes, I'm done, very quickly. Not the I.O. device, though. So programmed I.O. looks something like this. I've got an address register, a data register, and a status register all connected to an I.O. control module. And the I.O. control module is connected to some number of devices. So I pick which device by putting an address in the I.O. address register. I put data in the I.O. data register, and I might transfer a command through the I.O. status register. All right, flow of control works like this. I send a command to the device, um, and then I do this busy waiting loop. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? And a million or so times through that loop, pass, and finally, the I.O. device controller says, yep, I'm, I'm ready now, and I can read one device, I mean read one character. And then I send a command to read the next character. And as you can see, the CPU is very busy doing lots of nothing, and that's why it's called busy waiting. And busy waiting is not a happy thing. It, uh, particularly if you're really waiting for an I.O. device and not just the controller. 
An interrupt is an electronic signal to the CPU that causes the CPU to alter the flow of instruction execution. And it is exactly like what we think of, of as interrupt when we're talking about people. Um, I, I could be talking along here. One of you would ask a question. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop whatever I was doing, answer the question. And when I've answered the question, I'm going to go back to whatever I was doing. Same exact concept with interrupts in computers. Implementing interrupts frees that CPU from waiting for things. It can do other work, and it provides controls for external inputs. In interrupt-driven I.O., this is the second kind. I told you there were three kinds, um, programmed I.O. with busy waiting, interrupt-driven I.O., and direct memory access I.O. In interrupt-driven I.O., the CPU commands an I.O. device to do something, and then the CPU can go off and do other stuff. There's no busy waiting. And here is an example. I told you this clicker is going to get input asynchronously. The operating system has commanded the I.O. subsystem of this computer to read looking for a page down or to read keyboard. Okay. And now the CPU is doing other things. But... When I click the clicker, there will be an interrupt that allows the operating system to notice that I've clicked the clicker and do the next thing. So the I.O. device raises an interrupt when it's ready. The interrupt happens not when the operating system says read the keyboard. It happens when the keyboard has a character ready to deliver. The CPU when that interrupt signal, it's an electronic signal to the CPU, switches to code that handles the interrupt. And it does that at the end of the next instruction. It's going to save the program counter and then run this thing called an interrupt handler. And at the end, it's going to go back to whatever process was interrupted. Well, interrupt lines are part of the hardware the hardware asserting a signal on an interrupt line generates an interrupt request to the CPU. And at the end of the next fetch decode execute, the CPU can run the interrupt handler. Interrupt handlers are software um, programs that service the interrupt. They're also known as interrupt routines or interrupt service routines. A running program gets interrupted. Every time I press this clicker, PowerPoint gets interrupted, and the operating system gets a keyboard character, sends it back to PowerPoint, and PowerPoint changes the slide. But the point of that is that the interrupt handler has to save the state before starting the interrupt handling process and restore the state when it's done. And by state, I mean program counter and the states of the registers. So the fetch decode execute cycle works like this. Fetch decode execute and then test whether an interrupt has been asserted. Is there a signal on this interrupt line? If the answer is no, we go back and fetch the next instruction. If the answer is yes, the hardware invokes that software, which is the interrupt handler, the interrupt handler does its thing and then restores the state and we go back and fetch the next instruction from the program that was interrupted. It is exactly the same thing that happens when you ask a question in class. What else can I do with interrupts? I can notify the operating system that something outside has happened. Power supplies for computers store enough power to allow a tiny bit of work to be done if you pull the plug or if the giant storm knocks down the tree and turns off the lights as happened on the Kennesaw campus earlier this week. Um, and the power supply itself can generate this thing that's called a power fail interrupt to tell the operating system you better clean everything up because you got about two milliseconds before there's no more power to run the CPU.
Interrupts can be used to allocate CPU time. That's how it is that I can run more than one program at a time. Right now I'm only running the operating system in PowerPoint, but I could run PowerPoint in a web browser and be looking stuff up while I'm preparing slides. Interrupts are used to indicate abnormal events. This, in this case, the interrupt is generated within the CPU, an illegal instruction. So let's think about tiny binary computer. I have four bits of operation code, but I've only got nine instructions. 16 possibilities, only nine in use. The others are illegal instructions. That happens when a program goes off into the weeds and starts trying to execute the data. Um, but it is possible and something has to happen. Usually what happens with the illegal instruction is that the operating system blows that program right out of the water. Illegal address, trying to address a memory location that doesn't exist, or other kinds of hardware errors. There is this thing called a process control block, which we'll talk more about when we get to chapter six, software. Um, but it's in a reserved area of memory, sometimes the stack, sometimes called the program status word, and it is the process control block that is the place where the registers and program counter get stored. When an interrupt happens, where I said save state earlier, where we save the state is in that process control block. Then we can run the interrupt handler, and the last thing the interrupt handler does is restore the state from the process control block. We'll talk about more, talk about this when we get to operating systems. Handling an interrupt involves first saving the current program counter. Then we load the interrupt handler program address into the program counter. And remember, the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. And you all laugh at me every time I say that, but it's a key to how all of this stuff works. If I put the interrupt handler's first address into the program counter, the next thing that happens on the fetch, decode, and execute will be the first instruction of that interrupt handler. The interrupt handler runs. The interrupt handler saves the registers and that temporarily saved program counter in the process control block. Then the interrupt handler does what it needs to do to handle the interrupt, and that depends on what kind of interrupt and what kind of device. Finally, the interrupt handler restores the machine state, including the program counter, from the process control block. And since the program counter holds the address of the next instruction, the program that, was get, that got interrupted is going to start running again at exactly the point where it was interrupted. How cool is that? That is very cool. The machine state consists of the program counter and the values in the registers. And in the case of TBC, that would include the PZ latch. Now, um, I was talking about doing some stuff with middle school kids tomorrow. For a long time, I was the SPSU liaison to the Girl Sprouts. And I'm here to tell you, if you ask a room full of eight-year-old girls, how cool is that? You get very cool at, uh, at a high volume and high-pitched voices. I miss the Girl Sprouts. In a modern computer, we run multiple programs concurrently. And I carefully say concurrently, not simultaneously, okay? because unless I have multiple cores, I'm not doing things simultaneously. I'm doing things concurrently. So part of the hardware is a timer that generates an interrupt request every few hundred nanoseconds. So if, I'm, if I have a two gigahertz CPU, I am running two billion instructions every second. So a few hundred nanoseconds is many, many instructions. The interrupt routine for this interrupt, the timer interrupt, is part of the operating system. And the operating system can now decide that maybe some other program is going to run for a while. We'll talk about this in more detail when we get to uh, operating systems as well. Some kinds of instructions can cause interrupts.
Um, these are called software interrupts, and one of them is a way of communicating with the operating system. So an ordinary application program is not supposed to talk to the I.O. devices, but it needs to be able to say, hey, operating system, I need for you to do something for me. And then that program needs to stop and the operating system needs to run. So we need an interrupt to do that. I can have more than one interrupt request at the same time. And the CPU, in order to accommodate that, usually has more than one interrupt line. We can do it with only one, but it's, it's easier if we have multiple interrupt lines. I can have several interrupts pending at any given moment and it's up to the operating system to sort those out. We'll assign priorities in the, in the code of the operating system. We'll assign priorities to the interrupts, and we'll do time-sensitive events first. So if I'm receiving data um, from Ethernet, when that Ethernet buffer is full, I got to do something with it before the next byte comes along, or I'm going to lose data. That's a time-sensitive event. Important events, like a hardware error, might be at the next level of priority. Then, other stuff like disk I.O. or the, uh, the timer interrupt. The operating system contains a list of unconditional branch instructions, or maybe unconditional call instructions, one for each kind of interrupt. And remember I told you that we could do indirect addressing through memory? And this is what it's good for. Each instruction branches to the interrupt handler for some particular interrupt. There's a diagram coming up. Um, because all the branches are in one place, the operating system can find the right one easily. So this thing called an interrupt vector is nothing more than a list of addresses in memory. The operating system knows where the interrupt vector is, and suppose we're trying to handle interrupt number two. The operating system will first find the address of the interrupt vector, then it will index 0, 1, 2 to find the address of the interrupt handler for interrupt number two, and now it knows where it is and can run it. Sometimes we have only one interrupt line and only one service routine, and it is up to the service routine to determine which interrupt really occurred. This is called a polled interrupt, as opposed to one that gets dispatched through an interrupt table. The polling routine then calls the correct interrupt handler. Okay, change signals just a little bit. Some operations are required to be atomic. And by atomic, we mean indivisible in this case. We do not mean that they glow in the dark, okay? Indivisible. An example, and when you take your operating system course, you will learn about semaphores. A semaphore is a variable that can be tested and set in one atomic operation. And that means that no other program must be allowed to run while that semaphore is being set and tested, or tested and set. Well, we have this timer that can generate interrupts, and then the operating system decides who's going to run next. It is entirely possible that between testing the semaphore and setting it, a program could get interrupted. And it's entirely possible that the program that next runs does something with that semaphore. In order to prevent that from happening, we need to disable interrupts for anything that requires more than one instruction, more than one fetch decode execute. Okay? And so there are instructions within the operating system, not in application programs, to disable interrupts. We must not disable interrupts for more than a very few instruction times. By a very few, I kind of mean something I can count without using my thumb. That, that kind of very few. Because remember, we might have these time-sensitive events, like something comes down that Ethernet wire, and we need to be able to handle it timely. All right, here's how interrupts 
and disablement fit into the instruction cycle. We do fetch, decode, execute, and then test whether interrupts are disabled. If they are, we go right back to fetch the next instruction. Only if interrupts are not disabled do we check whether an interrupt has occurred. And if it has, we call the interrupt handler. Otherwise, we go back to fetch the next instruction. So we can turn off interrupts uh, for a very short period of time in order to allow combinations of instructions to execute atomically. We talked about programmed I.O. with busy waiting. The CPU is in charge of everything, but it cannot do anything else. We've also talked about interrupt-driven I.O. The CPU commands an I.O. device to start doing something, and then it can go off and do other things. The device raises an interrupt signal when it's done. We've talked about both of those two. The third one is this thing called Direct Memory Access, or DMA I.O., and it's used for things like disks and tapes. The CPU still sends commands to the I.O. module, but now the I.O. module has a connection to memory. And so it has its own memory address register and memory data register. Data can be transferred between the I.O. module and memory independent of the CPU. So I read one of those 4096 byte blocks off of the disk, and the I.O. controller can put that in a 4K memory location without bothering the CPU. We don't get an interrupt until it's done. With interrupt-driven I.O., I read a 4K block, I'm going to get an interrupt for every byte, 4,000 interrupts. With DNA I.O., I get only one interrupt when the whole block is in memory where it needs to be. And so you saw this diagram at the beginning of class. That's what the connection between the I.O. module and memory is for. So a DMA operation works like this. Um, we use programmed I.O. to send a command. Programmed I.O. with busy waiting, remember, very slow and inefficient. But we're only going to use it to send a command to the I.O. control module. And the I.O. control module is going to send back, gotcha, I'm on it. So we can, we can afford to do programmed I.O. for that. Uh, the command is the I.O. device, the location of data on the I.O. device, the starting location in memory, the amount of data to transfer, whether we are reading or writing. Now, the DMA I.O. control module does everything else. It doesn't raise an interrupt until the complete transfer is finished. This is very cool, too. This took a lot of work off of the CPU. Okay, advantage, only one CPU command to start I.O. Details of the input and output operation are handled by the controller. CPU doesn't have to worry about it. Only one interrupt, and only when everything is done. On the other hand, the I.O. module steals cycles on the memory bus. So if you read about cycle stealing, this is, this is it. While the I.O. control module is reading memory or writing to memory, the CPU can't. And we have to build some more complex bus logic that, that essentially is a traffic cop that says who can use the memory bus right now. Um, we call that bus arbitration, but it's traffic cop on the, on the memory bus. We run multiple programs concurrently on modern computers. If two programs want to do I.O. at the same time, and we allowed application programs to do I.O., we would have big trouble. And let me give you an example. My program is going to write something to a particular disk block at a particular location. And I move the disk head, and I'm waiting for that block to come around. And an interrupt happens. And your program moves the disk head. Then my program does a write. My data are gone forever. They're not really gone. They're written on the disk somewhere, but nobody has a clue where. And I've messed up somebody else's data. This is bad news. You, you may have heard of NoSQL databases.
And if you have heard of them, you think of them as something from the current century. The first NoSQL database was invented in the 1990s by a guy with the unhappy name of Dick Pick. And uh, it had the idea of, of lost data, which they called a group format error. But everybody who worked with the PIC operating system said GFE stands for gone forever. So this is the thing. The way we do it instead is the program requests an I.O. operation from the operating system. Now the operating system blocks the program, and by blocks the program, I mean it just doesn't let it run. It doesn't assign the CPU to it anymore until the operating system finishes the I.O., and then the program that asked for the I.O. operation can be unblocked. Now we have only one program, the operating system, controlling that reading and writing from disk, and it can be, if it's written carefully, designed so that the conflict that I described does not occur. Now we have another problem, and it's how do we keep the ordinary application program from doing their own I.O.? And the answer to that is this thing called a privileged instruction. The CPU has a mode bit, and it can be in two states, on or off, and we're going to call those two states the system state or the application state. I.O. instructions only work when the system is in the system state. Otherwise, we get an illegal instruction interrupt, and the application program that tried to do its own I.O. gets blown out of the water by the operating system. The CPU and the I.O. module are both connected to the memory bus. If they both need memory at the same time, there's trouble there as well. And the solution in this case is that one or the other of them can take control of the bus. And it's a who, who gets there first. That's the traffic cop on the memory bus that I mentioned earlier. And that means that both the CPU and the I.O. module have to test for bus busy before they transfer data and wait if it is busy. We're going to talk about caches again later as well, but almost every computer these days has one or more levels of cache memory. And the reason for that is that that memory is much slower than the CPU. Last time I told you that for a 4 gigahertz processor, memory is about 80 times slower than the CPU. So a pretty big difference. Cache memory is small, fast memory that is close to the CPU, but it brings a problem called cache coherence. If I have something in cache memory, but the CPU updates the area of main memory, now cache and main memory are no longer synchronized. This is bad news, okay? And so we have to do something about that. Being sure that cache and main memory match is called cache coherence. And as soon as we have both cache memory and DMA in the same computer, we have to worry about cache coherence. This is why all of those extra transistors that we get from Moore's Law are so necessary. Hardware could invalidate the cache entries. Um, there is something called a snooping cache which listens to the memory address, uh, listens to the memory address lines. And if somebody writes to a memory address that the cache has cached, the cache invalidates that line. That way, the next request has to go all the way to memory. The operating system knows about DMA transfers, and so it could also invalidate cache entries. We could move the complexity from the hardware listening to the memory address bus to the operating system keeping track of what DMA transfers it has asked for. That is how most computers that any of us will ever touch work. Mainframes, mainframe computers, and they still exist, and uh, some fairly large portion of the Fortune 100 companies still use mainframes. 
banks and airlines, banks and airlines. Um, they take an entirely different approach, and it's this thing called the I.O. channel. The I.O. channel is a computer. It's, it's not a big computer, but it is a computer, and it is one that handles all of the details of input and output. And so it extends the concept of direct memory access to essentially to a much larger area. And that is how banks and airlines handle thousands of terminals and hundreds of disks without sinking under the I.O. load. I.O. buses, specialized buses that connect I.O. devices. Um, the characteristics in general, the descriptive characteristics of an I.O. bus are how fast can it signal whether it's serial or parallel, and whether it's single or multi-point connection. Modern buses use serial transmission. Remember, we talked about bus skew, both last time and the time before that. Uh, bus skew happens on parallel buses if one bit arrives more than one bit time, either early or late. If there are multiple devices connected to a bus, we need some sort of bus arbitration some sort of traffic cop. General purpose buses include the universal serial bus. Um, almost everybody has something that plugs into a USB socket on you today. I do even. Um, the serial ATA bus, which is used for connecting magnetic disks. The PCI Express bus, which is an internal bus and a high-speed internal bus. Then we have the buses for connecting displays, the HDMI um, high definition multimedia interface, which carries both uh, video and sound, and the display port. Display ports can carry sound. All right. The universal serial bus was initially for things like mouses and keyboards, and initially had an A connector and a B connector with the A connector supposed to be connected to the computer and the B connector connected to the device. The reason for that is that from the beginning, USB could supply five volts to do things like power a mouse or a keyboard. And you didn't want to connect it up backwards. One host and one or more peripheral devices in the original design. Um, USB hubs up to 127 devices on one universal serial bus. USB 2, which is now history, up to 480 megabyte, megabits per second. Zot, USB 3.2, up to 20 gigabits per second, assuming you have the right kind of cables. USB 4, 40 gigabits per second. And I can carry DisplayPort and PCI Express connections over USB if I wanted to do that. There is now a power delivery standard, USB PD, that can deliver 100 watts, um, that is 20 volts at 5 amps. That's quite a lot of power. USB-C uses a symmetric connector. It can be plugged in in either direction. There's no no sense of upside or downside, um, so rotationally symmetric. No distinction between host and device. The two USB connectors figure out who is host and who is device. 24 pins. We started out with like five conductors. Now we've got 24 of them, including four shielded data pairs. Power negotiated by the devices on the cable. Um, there is an embedded circuit called an EMARC circuit that identifies the kind of cable. And it's compatible with um, Apple's Thunderbolt specification. Okay, listen up. If you haven't been doing the reading, read the USB section of the book because it will save you from making an expensive mistake. If you have been doing the reading, that's good. You've already read it. 100 watts is a lot of power, and there are substandard cables, often imported from somewhere else, that can 
cause equipment damage or even fires. All right, so everybody here is old enough to remember 100 watt incandescent bulbs. If you touched one, it would burn you. Right? There's, there's a lot of power there. And the substandard cables, man, if you let all the smoke out of your whole entire computer, it'll make you an unhappy camper. <coughs> Pardon me. So you're looking for that USB certified mark. And you're being careful of things like an adapter that connects USB-C to USB-A. Because if the USB-A is your computer and the USB-C is something that has 100 watts of power on it, you might wish you hadn't done that. Okay? This is something to be careful of. One of the reviewers of the textbook just got on my case for saying the section on USB is too long and too detailed. And I said, yeah, it's too long. And yeah, it's got a lot of detail, but you know what? It's going to save somebody from blowing up their computer. So I left it long and detailed. Reviewers are supposed to improve things. Okay, so read the USB section, okay? The serial ATA bus, mass storage devices, disks, really. Um, optical devices, you can use it for solid state storage. Um, there's a typo there, I'll have to figure it out. Um, it replaced the parallel ATE bus, ATA bus, also called the IDE bus, compatible with ATA software, but not compatible with hardware because serial or parallel, right? One or the other. Um, up to 600 megabytes per second. As SATA Express can be either serial ATA or PCI Express and get up to 600 gigabytes per second. Okay, you've seen this slide before. You saw it when we were talking about buses. Serial parallel expansion and used internally, okay? Full duplex operation. Each pair is a lane, um, a link, some number of lanes from 1 to 32. And each lane transmits a byte stream. Now here's the part that you didn't, that we didn't talk about before. PCI Express is really a packet switched protocol. Um, we're doing much the same thing that we do with Ethernet, but we're doing it at very high speed. The interface circuits hide the complexity. And we get an interface that is similar to a one byte wide parallel interface. Okay. But we're doing serial communication much faster than serial ATA, and so suitable for connecting both the CPU and memory and the CPU and display devices. Modern solid state disks have PCI Express interfaces. The first ones didn't, um, and we'll talk about that. Um, so I told you we would see a better description, a better diagram of how the I.O. and the CPU get related. On the CPU chip package, there in a modern chip design, there will be a PCI Express root complex hub, essentially, with connections for a graphic device and for memory at very high speed, and then connections for a PCI Express switch, a USB bridge, and a serial ATA bridge. So at at the heart of things, what used to be called the North Bridge, we have PCI Express these days. All right, if there are no questions, thank you very much, gentlemen and lady, and I'll see you on Tuesday when we'll talk about I.O. devices.